For the comprehensive final for the Bio 202 class, we'll go through a few highlights from each of the chapters. The endocrine system, lipid-soluble hormones will cross the cell membrane to bind to receptors inside and longer cellular response times. Whereas in contrast, on the right, we can see water-soluble hormones binding to surface receptors, which activate quick-acting second messenger systems. The posterior pituitary gland has a direct nerve connection from the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary gland, however, receives hormone signals from the hypothalamus. So we can see a direct nerve this way, or we can see this capillary bed. Within the thyroid, the follicular cells of the thyroid gland, they are the ones that would be forming these circles, they release T3 and T4. So remember, follicular cells release T3 and T4, while parafollicular cells are going to release calcitonin. They are out here in the adjacent areas. Calcitonin is going to decrease blood calcium, whereas in contrast, the parathyroid hormone from parathyroid glands located on the posterior side of the thyroid gland will increase blood calcium. Thus, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone do opposite to each other. They do come from two different glands. Calcitonin decreases blood calcium, whereas parathyroid hormone increases. And to get back the follicular cells that release T3 and T4, that affects metabolism. In the pancreas, glucagon is released by alpha cells to raise blood glucose levels between meals. Insulin is released from beta cells and decreases blood glucose after a meal, sending the glucose into the cells or to storage areas. The adrenal cortex has three layers called zona. Zona glomerulosa releases several hormones that are known as mineral corticoids. Zona fasciculata releases hormones from the glucocorticoid family. And the innermost zona releases sex hormones, mostly androgens. The pineal gland in the brain releases melatonin. Melatonin is important for our sleep-wake cycle and hormonal co coordination. For the blood, when blood is taken out and then spun in a centrifuge, it separates into plasma and cellular components, with plasma making up half or more. The formed elements just mean cells. This part is mostly red blood cells to carry oxygen. The buffy coat is made up of white cells that work with our immune system, as well as cell fragments known as platelets. Those are all contained within the buffy coat. Back to the plasma. There are three main proteins you need to be familiar with. Albumin, that maintains the osmotic gradient between blood and tissues, as well as buffering pH. Lipoproteins are in two groups, one our immunoglobulins, and the other is our LDL and HDL cholesterol. Fibrinogen is the third protein in the plasma, and it's used in the last step of forming a blood clot when it's activated by prothrombin. You should know the five types of white blood cells, from most numerous to least. The order is never let monkeys eat bananas. Neutrophils make up over 60% of the white blood cells as they are the first responders in an acute situation. Lymphocytes are our B and T cells and make up 20 to 40%. Monocytes are 2 to 8% in the blood and are macrophages in the tissues. They increase in numbers during chronic infections. The least two are eosinophils with less than 4% and basophils with less than 1%. The life cycle of a red blood cell begins in the bone marrow. The red blood cell has no nucleus, so will only survive for 120 days. The spleen is the primary target organ that removes worn out old red blood cells from circulation. The bilirubin 
from the broken down red blood cells are removed primarily by the liver, but the kidneys also play a role. You should be able to identify chambers, valves, and vessels from a diagram of the heart. For the three main coronaries, which were the right, left anterior descending, and left circumflex, you should know the regions of the heart that they serve blood to. The right coronary artery feeds the whole right side of the heart. The left anterior descending delivers blood mostly to the anterior left ventricle. The left circumflex is the lateral and posterior part of the left ventricle. The three main segments of the electrocardiogram are the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. The P wave represents the electrical signal spreading across the atria. This is called atrial depolarization. The QRS complex represents the electrical signal as it travels down the interventricular septum and then back up the free walls. This is ventricular depolarization. Finally, the T wave represents the ventricular resetting of its sodium and potassium ions. Thus, the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. There are two bypasses in the heart of a fetus. Since the blood is oxygenated by the placenta, not all the blood needs to go to the lungs, so much of it is diverted to the left side of the heart or straight to the aorta. The foramen ovale allows blood to go straight from the right atrium to the left atrium. The ductus arteriosus is a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So blood leaves the pulmonary artery to go to the aorta instead of the lungs. Both of these bypasses close after the baby is born. You should be able to name all the arteries that are in this diagram. For the immune system, I'd like you to hear the sample of some of the terms. I would encourage you to find many other terms within the immune system lecture. Then attribute them to either non-specific immune system family or the specific immune system family. So for instance, inflammation is non-specific while memory cells are both a characteristic of B and T cells and that's why that we're part of the specific immune system because it can remember specific antigens. Fever, it's a general non-specific response. Plasma cells are a type of B cell and thus part of the specific immune system. Cytotoxic T cells, they are in the T cell family and thus specific. Antibodies, well, they're made by the plasma cells, which are a B cell, and they are part of the specific immune system. Every antibody is targeted for a different antigen. Macrophages are nonspecific. It goes and consumes damaged tissue as well as consuming any antigen. B cells, that is part of our immune system that directs specific antigens and complement is part of our nonspecific immune system. The upper respiratory tract, the nasal cavity, contains three nasal concha. We have this here, one, this is the superior, the middle, and the inferior. We can see them again here, superior, middle, and inferior. The purpose of these concha is to create turbulence. Turbulence is critical because it allows the air to stay in the nasal cavity just a little bit longer so that the air can become adjusted to body temperature, humidified, and allow for some debris removal out of the air before entering the rest of the airway. The laryngopharynx is the last place where both food and air share the same space. To prevent food from entering the airway, the epiglottis will flip down and cover the larynx when we swallow food. Along the respiratory tract, there is pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue with cilia and mucus producing goblet cells all through the upper portion of the trachea as well as our bronchioles.
the airborne debris will stick to the mucus and the cilia will actually migrate and move any debris up and out of the body. At the very end, down at our alveoli, at all the end where we're actually exchanging gas, where we're exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen, the tissue is going to be as thin as possible. And here we are going to have simple squamous epithelial tissue. This is ideal tissue for diffusion to occur across alveolar walls. The air around us that we breathe is made up of many molecules, most of which is nitrogen. Oxygen is only 21% of the air. You can calculate the partial pressure of oxygen in the air by taking atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, at sea level and times it by 0.21 and you'll get what the actual partial pressure of oxygen is. The number for atmospheric pressure decreases as you go up in elevation where the atmospheric pressure becomes less. The amount of oxygen in a space or fluid is identified as the partial pressure of that molecule, and it's represented in millimeters of mercury. In the alveoli, we will have the greatest amount of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters of mercury. This is slightly higher than it would be for arterial blood, which is at 100 millimeters of mercury. After the tissues have taken out oxygen to the cells to generate ATP, the venous blood's partial pressure of oxygen has dropped to below 60 millimeters of mercury, more often closer to 40. This just depends on the activity level of the person. So I would just like you to realize when you see a partial pressure of oxygen number that you can attribute to it, whether it's an alveolus, or arteries, or it's an arterial number at 100, or anything but less than 60 is gonna be a normal venous partial pressure of oxygen. In some basic terminology in reference to carbon dioxide, I'd like you to know about capnia. So if we have hypercapnia is excessive carbon dioxide levels. So if we have too much carbon dioxide building up, the person would be hypercapnic. Contrast, hypocapnia would be a lower than normal level of carbon dioxide. Likewise, low oxygen levels is hypoxia. Here's just a basic kidney diagram. You should be able to name all of the features on here. So number one we'll look at is the cortex. Two looks like the renal medulla, whereas three is the renal sinus. Four is the, uh, looks like the ureter. Five is the hilus, or this sort of entry point into the kidney. Six is the ureter, so that makes four the renal pelvis, sorry. Seven looks like the papilla at the bottom of a pyramid. Eight looks like the renal pyramid. Nine is a minor calyx. 10 is a major calyx. 11 is renal or renal columns, and 12 is the renal capsule. You should also be familiar with the anatomy of a single nephron. One would be the glomerulus, two is the Bowman's capsule, and together they are the renal corpuscle. Three is the proximal convoluted tubule. Four is the lupa henle, specifically the descending limb made of simple squamous epithelial tissue. Number five is the distal convoluted tubule, and number six is the collecting duct. Along the GI tract, we have many regions and features. The esophagus, the gastroesophageal sphincter, the fundus of the stomach, pyloric sphincter of the stomach, this is the splenic or left colic flexure, the cecum, is the first part of the large intestine, ascending colon, hepatic or right splenic flexure, descending colon, and sigmoid colon. Digestive aids come from the pancreas and gallbladder into the duodenum of the small intestine. Bile is made in the liver, but the gallbladder is the storage pouch 
to hold bile. The cystic duct takes bile to and from the gallbladder. The common hepatic duct brings bile out of the liver. The common bile duct brings all bile from both the liver and gallbladder straight to the duodenum and out the sphincter of Odi. The pancreas creates digestive enzymes that travel down the pancreatic duct to the sphincter of Odi and also into the duodenum. Sperm are produced in the testes. They mature in the epididymis and travel into the body via the ductus or vas deferens to ultimately be stored in the ampulla located behind the prostate gland. Next to the ampulla of the vas deferens is the seminal vesicle, which makes the majority of seminal fluid. Upon ejaculation, both sperm from the ampulla and seminal fluid from the seminal vesicles are released into the ejaculatory duct within the prostate gland. Then exiting via the prostatic urethra and finally the spongy urethra. The female reproductive cycle normally occurs over four weeks. For each week, you should know the phase of the ovary, the phase of the endometrium, and the dominant hormone. The first week, is when the new follicles begin to develop in the ovary called the follicular phase. The endometrium is removing the lining during its menstrual phase and the hormones are at their lowest levels. The second week continues at the follicular development or egg development in the ovary, so we're still in the follicular phase. The endometrium has begun rebuilding the lining in the proliferative phase. Estrogen is the dominant hormone that drives the tissue growth of the endometrium. The final two weeks after the egg has been released or ovulated, the ovary is now in the luteal phase where progesterone is being released. Progesterone in turn stimulates the glands within the endometrium to begin secretions in preparation for implantation. If an egg gets fertilized within the first 24 to 48 hours, that is, the duration of progesterone secretion and thus the luteal and secretory phases is exactly two weeks during weeks three and four. After that time, the hormone levels will drop and the next menstrual phase will begin. Once an egg is ovulated, it's viable for fertilization by a sperm for 24 hours. Once the sperm and egg are combined, the cell now has 46 chromosomes and be called, can be called a zygote, and this is day one. Further development continues, and by day three, it is a solid ball of cells called the marola and is still traveling down the fallopian tube. By day five, it becomes a blastocyst where it has differentiated into a cell mass to become an embryo and an outer shell for implantation and development of support structures like the placenta. By day five to seven, this blastocyst can be implanted into the endometrium.